Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Brushy Fork Baptist Church. We're excited uh, to worship the Lord together. And uh, I got to tell you, you're in trouble. I broke my watch band this week, so it's at home on the uh, uh, table. And uh, my dress watch that I wear on Saturday. <laughs> My biggest critic. <laughs> my my dress watch, the battery's dead in it, so uh, we're just uh, left to our own devices today. We'll let you know what time. And that clock says it's time to quit. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Well, all, all funniness aside, I want to say thank you for all your. Uh, gifts and uh, cards and uh, just wishes of appreciation this month for Pastor Appreciation Month. Uh, Carrie and I and the kids feel extremely appreciated and we're thankful uh, for that. And we certainly appreciate uh, you folks uh, too. So thank you so much uh, for that. Also, uh, if uh, Denny and uh, Gary Latire and I or Wes, when he gets here, uh, if you pat us on the back and you hear an extra grunt, that's because uh, we spent some some time and effort uh, putting in the the flower beds wall uh, there in front. Uh, but I want to thank those guys for their effort uh, Friday and Saturday. So uh, we're thankful uh, for that. I got those uh, uh, those landscaping timbers were quite rotten <laughs> when we when we pulled them out. So they needed to be replaced and. And updated so hopefully we won't have to touch that thing in a long 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 time uh, but we're thankful uh, for that let's uh, turn to Psalm chapter 3 oh Lord how many are my foes many are rising against me many are saying of my soul there is no salvation for him in God but you O oh Lord are a shield about me my glory and the lifter of my head, I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy heel. I lay down and slept, I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Here, David is thankful for the Lord preserving uh, his life, especially as he fled his uh, own son Absalom, who was seeking, seeking to kill him and to take the throne. But David ended this psalm on, in verse 8 with salvation belongs to the Lord. Isn't that true? Uh, we go through life trying to save ourselves from any number of circumstance or any number of uh, situation. And oftentimes that goes rather poorly for us, doesn't it? But only the Lord can reach down and truly save us. And he has made all his people blessed. We can be thankful for that this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for all your many blessings. Lord, we thank you that uh, we can come together and encourage each other and, and uh, love on each other. And Lord, just express uh, all the, the thankfulness that you have given to us. Lord, that uh, we can be uh, friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, we thank you uh, for that. I pray, Lord, that uh, you would uh, just be with us this morning, that your word would speak to us, and Lord, it would challenge us, Lord, it would uh, convict us and make us more like Jesus. Lord, I pray your spirit would, would move within us. I pray, Lord, that uh, you would uh, just be with those that uh, can't be here, and, and Lord, I pray for those that are sick, and, and Lord, uh, that are away from us. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with them, meet their needs, heal them, and Lord, we just thank you uh, for that. Thank you for all your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Well.
Well, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to continue uh, looking at our uh, Thanksgiving sermon series uh, about uh, our thankfulness in Christ. How he is the, the wellspring by which uh, our thankfulness should flow. Uh, so this morning, I want us to look at uh, the love that Christ has shown for us and to be thankful that we are chosen in him. That we are chosen in uh, Christ. Uh, this morning from Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, a lot of times, uh, people will uh, get bogged down with the discussion of predestination and foreknowledge and human responsibility and freedom. But uh, this morning, uh, my emphasis is not to try to uh, open up those and, and explain those. We'll do that uh, probably at a, at a different time and, and look at those and try to understand what the Lord is saying. But I want us to specifically look at... Uh, how Paul points to the fact that all of the blessings that we have received, uh, physical but primarily spiritual, um, have come because we are in Christ. Uh, so as we, uh, as we look at that, I want us to, to focus on being thankful. I can tell you that this week I was incredibly thankful uh, for a backhoe. Uh, if we tried to dig that trench by hand, uh, we probably would still be there a year from now. Uh, being right up against the, uh, the parking lot, there was plenty of gravel we would have had to have gone through with that. So I was very thankful that Denny brought his backhoe over and we were able to knock that out in, in a, a, a morning into the afternoon. Uh, because uh, it would have been quite a task without that. But there are things that we encounter. There are, there are times in our life where, where we are especially thankful for something, right? The Lord brings a circumstance or brings a situation or brings a person into our lives. And we can be thankful for that. Well, this morning, Paul points us to the fact that we can be thankful that uh, we are chosen in Christ. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 3. We're going to read 3 and 4 and then 7 through 10 and then 18 through 20. So we're going to jump around a little bit here in Ephesians chapter 1. But look at, uh, look at these verses and uh, let's focus on Paul's word of thankfulness that we are chosen in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And then in verse 18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great mind, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Let's pray. Father, as we look at uh, these verses here in Ephesians chapter 1, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, impress upon us, Lord, the, uh, the love that you have for us, Lord, that you chose us in Christ. And Lord, that that uh, is an important understanding. Uh, Lord, it, 
it may uh, we may first be thought, led to think that it may uh, bring us pride into our lives, but Lord, of all things, it dispels the pride because we recognize that it was not anything in us for which we were chosen, but it was by the good pleasure of Jesus. And, and Lord, uh, you chose us in him. When you look at us, you see your son. And Lord, we are thankful for that. Lord, uh, the spiritual blessings of that reality uh, will, uh, will be uh, brought new to us each and every day for all of eternity. Lord, we thank you for that. Be with us. Lord, I pray that you would uh, open our hearts to the truth that your spirit would teach us. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning, as we look at these verses, I want us to see that we should let the wellspring of thanksgiving overflow because we were chosen in Christ. We should let the wellspring, the, the very thing, uh, the thankfulness in our lives should spring up and it should overflow because we were chosen in Christ. First. Lay hold of God's love in your life as you recognize that you were chosen in Christ. First, we need to lay hold of God's love. And we, we see this in, in verse 3. As uh, Paul tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. <laughs> Here Paul Points the church of Ephesus. After he introduced this quick introduction, uh, he gave uh, his blessing in, in verse 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wants us to know that, that we are blessed to know the God that has revealed himself to us. Last week we talked about how uh, Thanksgiving should be uh, should flow out of the fact that God revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Here Paul is, is uh, piggybacking on that idea. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who sent him. The one who revealed to him. Why? Why should we bless God's name? Well... It was he who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. One word that is very popular in, uh, in uh, the news and uh, just different things today is, is equity, isn't it? And, and the idea of equity is that everything would be flat across uh, the plane that that everybody there wouldn't be any imbalance in, in things and, and we recognize that here on this fallen world that is a fool's errand isn't it there will never fully be be equity across the board there there are people that uh, that are have more means than others and there are people that have less means than others there are people that are more gifted and, and less gifted there are, there are people that that, that uh, God's purposes, uh, are different. God's purpose, there are disparity in God's purposes. But here we have a very important truth. That if we want to know what true equity and how true equity is, it is the fact that those who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they have received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Think about that. There's no difference between any person that places their faith in Jesus, they have received everything that God can give them in spiritual blessing. They have received the, the Holy Spirit. God, God has given them the Holy Spirit, the very power of Christ, that, that he uh, overcame death and, and he lived the perfect life. The very power that he accomplished that in has been given to us and dwells within us. On this fallen earth, we don't see much of equity, but in God's plan, in his bestowing of the gifts upon us, all the spiritual things have been given to us. We lack nothing spiritually if we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That is a remarkable thought. 
We can tap in to the very uh, revelation and, and being of God through our relationship with Jesus. And we lack nothing. There's nothing to be jealous over spiritually. Each and every one of us has access to, the, to God the Father through the person of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. That is true equity. That is true realization of, of the love that God has given us. It doesn't matter if we were like Paul and we held the garments of, of those that, that martyred somebody for their faith. We can still have every spiritual blessing given to us through our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what we have done. It matters who we have placed our faith in. That is a remarkable statement that Paul starts out with. That blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We lack nothing spiritually. And then he tells us in verse 4, even as he chose us in him, if, if it wasn't enough for, for Paul to tell us that, uh, that we lack no spiritual blessings, he wants to heap blessing upon that and tell us that God's love for us is so emphatic. God's love for us is so deep that he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. What in the world does that mean? What does it mean that we were chosen in Christ? What does it mean that God chose us in his son? Well, some might be tempted to think that it was something within them that led God to choose them in Christ. But the Bible dispels all of that. It is, it is not for the good that is in us that God chose us, but it is because of his son. It is the work of Christ that God did. And we can't fully understand how we can't fully uh, tease that out, but it points to the fact that God's great love for us in the fact that in his plan of redemption, he had a special place for each and every person that would place their faith in Jesus. He chose us, not for our own goodness, but because of his own good pleasure. And that is a remarkable thing. Jesus went to the cross knowing he was bearing the, the guilt and shame and sin punishment that we deserve. And he went to the cross to pay that for each and every person that would place their faith in Jesus. So not only has God given us every spiritual blessing in Christ, but he has heaped love upon that and shown us that he has chosen us. We are special to him. Because he chose us before he created the world. In his, in God's mind that is outside of time, where he doesn't experience things like we do uh, sequentially, God is able to see everything from beginning to end and uh, work his sovereign will out. And in that process, he knew each and every one of us that would believe in Jesus and he chose us. In his love. Even before he spoke a word of creation. That should lead us to say what a mighty God we serve. What a loving God we serve. Before he spoke the animals into existence we were on his mind. And God had a purpose for us. That we would be conformed to the image of Christ. And he explained that. Paul explained that by saying that we should be holy and blameless before him 
in love. God so loved us that he chose us in Christ and he's, he's bestowed that love upon us. And through that love, we can be holy and blameless before him. What a remarkable truth. What, what a truth to lead us to proclaim uh, the thankfulness that we have for the God that we serve. Who, if we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he will give us every spiritual blessing that there is. And he had chosen us before he spoke the world into existence. What a love the Father has given to us. This dispels any aspect of pride. It only drives our eyes to wonder and marvel at God's infinite wisdom and plan. Because if we had tried to come up with this, it wouldn't have happened. Only God can do something this special and this marvelous. So lay hold of God's love for you as he chose you before the foundation of the world in Christ. <clears throat> Secondly, recognize God's plan of redemption and the grace extended to us in that plan. Look at God's plan of redemption and the love that he shares for us to lead us to be thankful to receive that love. Starting in verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Why did God send his one and only son to die on that old rugged cross to bear my sin guilt and your sin guilt? It's not because of the goodness that resides in us. No. It's because he purposed in his plan. And Paul tells us that in him we have redemption through his blood. Christ sacrificed himself. He shed his blood on that old rugged cross for our trespasses and sins, for the forgiveness of those trespasses. Why? According to the riches of his grace. Christ's sacrifice on our behalf is all grace. Nothing we have done has earned it. It's all God's love poured upon us. And God is rich in his grace. He has accomplished this through his son. And look at verse 8, which he lavished upon us. God lavished this love and grace upon us in all wisdom and insight. What's Paul saying there? God knew what he was doing. And God had a purpose and a plan for what he was doing. And even though this grace and this mercy and this love should leave us in marvel and wonder, God has lavished it upon us. And look at verse 9 making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Last week, we looked at Christ as our revelation and it should be the means by which we are led into thanksgiving that God revealed himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And here Paul points to that in verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will. God God showed us who he was through his person and he, uh, through the person of Jesus Christ and he revealed to us the mystery of his love as Jesus interacted with his disciples and as Jesus went to that old rugged cross on our behalf. God revealed all of this to us in Christ and he didn't have. He didn't have to do that, but in his grace and his mercy, he did that. He didn't leave us wondering. He told us exactly what he was doing and why he was doing it. We know that Jesus came to die on our behalf. We know that Jesus lived the perfect life that we failed at. And Jesus died in our place, offering us the free gift of eternal life. And that was God's purpose. 
And we see the, the love and, and mercy of God in that expression. And in verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and in things on earth. Paul then points to the culmination of God's plan. God's not going to leave this world fallen forever. God's not going to leave us in uh, with the, the effects of sin in this world, both what that does to the outside world and that does to, to ourselves and our bodies. But God has made this plan so that uh, redemption will happen and all things will be united to him. We read about that in, in Revelation 20 and 21, the new heavens and the new earth. When, when that trumpet sounds in, in chapter 19 of Revelation, we're called up to him and we descend in, in judgment to him. And then God restores the whole world. And then we live in the new heavens and the new earth. God is uniting all things to him. This isn't an Eastern idea of pantheism where God resides in the trees and God resides in the animals and God resides in the people. No, God is talking about uniting the relationship, restoring that relationship of creation, of proper created beings in relationship to their creator. And that can only happen through the he new heavens and the new earth. God is going to set everything right. It's interesting. Uh, since... Uh, the, the tragic invasion of Israel on, on October 6th of, of last year. I've been listening to a, uh, a news update from Israel uh, put out by the, the Times of Israel. And uh, they oftentimes close that with the very common Jewish proclamation of Shalom and then the day. What, what is the idea of shalom in the, in the Old Testament and the Jewish mind? And that is that everything would be in its rightful place and at peace. And that's what God promises us in verse 10. Everything will be united to Christ. Everything will be set right. And everything will be at peace. And it comes through Christ and his work on the cross. So first... Lay hold of God's love for you as he chose you in Christ. Second, recognize God's plan of redemption and grace extended to you, to us. Third, hold on to the hope of Christ. Look at the hope that, uh, that Paul gives us starting in verse 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Let's work backwards from verse 20 and look at all he tells us in 19 and 18. First, we have to see that, that everything that God has accomplished, everything that he has promised... All of this has been accomplished through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. His perfect life lived on our behalf. And when he was raised from the dead, then that promise was extended to us. God accomplished his great and mighty works. And then Jesus was seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. Well, well what does that accomplish? Well, let's look at uh, at verse 18, uh, with that in mind, recognizing that, that uh, God accomplished all this through the resurrection and death and in the life of Jesus. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Paul is pointing to the fact that this is a, not a natural state we live in. If we have a relationship with God, that is not the state in which we were born into. In fact, uh, Paul will tell us in, in other places in his other writings that there was a, a natural enmity between us and God. Our sins had separated us from him. And God bridged that gap through the person of Jesus Christ. And Paul points to the fact that, that our eyes had to be opened. We had to be enlightened of the truth of the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. 
that comes as we hear the message of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and respond to it. As we place our faith in Jesus and we ask him to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that hope of the gospel, our eyes are enlightened and we receive the hope that has been given to us. The hope to which he has called you. God has a calling upon our lives. He has a plan for each and every one of his children. And that, that plan is not to, uh, to hurt them or to, to throw them into chaos, but it is to prosper them and to encourage them and to nurture them. He has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? God is seeking to give us an inheritance, an inheritance that Jesus purchased on that old rugged cross. And then verse 19, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? What is that immeasurable greatness? It is the revelation of Jesus. It's the fact that we are united with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's the fact that God doesn't see us in our sins and in our judgment, but instead he looks at the children of God with eyes to Christ. He sees his son and he sees us. What a great and mighty work of love God has given us. God has heaped grace and mercy upon us. He has loved us in such a, uh, an amazing way that he chose us in Christ. And because of that, the wellspring of thanksgiving should ever present be in our hearts. We have so much to be thankful for if we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Because we were chosen in Christ, God has been revealed to us through the person of Jesus Christ. And in the weeks to come, we're going to mine even more characteristics of Christ that bring us blessing and lead us to thanksgiving. But today, may the truth of God's love for you wash over you as you recognize that you were chosen by God in his one and only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. God loves you with an, a deep and abiding love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, what you have done for us. Lord, we thank you that, that Jesus is both our revelation and Lord, that uh, he also sh proves and shares the love that you have for us, that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Lord, we can't explain that. We can't wrap our minds around it completely, but Lord, the truth and the depth of that is so important. Lord, help us to, to understand that. And Lord, help us to be thankful for what we have received in Christ. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. If you feel like the Lord is leading you to have a personal relationship with him, then let me just share with you the best news. To share with you the best news, I have to share with you the bad news. The bad news is that we are sinners uh, and we fall short of the glory of God. Paul tells us for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That means that that relationship in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that Adam and Eve had, that they had, were in relationship with God, that means that our sins break that relationship. Just like Adam and Eve rebelled against God, we are sinners too, and we rebel against God, and that relationship is broken. That's bad news, but that's not the worst news. The worst news is we can't fix that relationship. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That means uh, the, what we have earned by our sin is death, and we can't change that. That's depressing. That's hard. But God doesn't leave us there. Thankfully, he gives us good news, even amongst this bad news and the worst news. God gives us good news, and the good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus came. He died on an old rugged cross. He, he lived the perfect life that God called us to. He died on our behalf, and, and Jesus offers us the free gift 
of eternal life. He offers us salvation. That's the good news, but the best news is that Jesus' offer can be applied on our account. We can know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. We can have that relationship restored. How do we do that? We do that by faith. Faith is an odd word, but it simply means trust. I'm trusting that the seat that I'm sitting in is going to keep me off the floor. We have to place our faith. We have to trust that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he said he did. We have to trust that. And we have to trust that he will honor his promises, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We express that oftentimes by praying. So if you'd like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to pray a prayer uh, something like this, where you uh, tell God that you recognize that you are a sinner. And that your sins have separated and broken that relationship with him. And to tell him that you're sorry. And, and to realize that Jesus uh, came to be the answer. He came to, to die and to live the perfect life and to die in your place. And that you are accepting, you believe that Jesus did that. And you want his death to be applied to your account. You want the forgiveness of your sins and you want to follow Jesus in obedience the rest of your life. If you've made that decision, would you reach out to us? Would you email us at info at brushyforkbaptist.com or contact us on Facebook? We'd love to hear that you've made a, a commitment to follow the Lord. God bless.